I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Kevin Newth, professor of physics at the University of Albany with over two decades of experience in machine learning algorithms for astrophysics, Bayesian probability theory, information theory, robotics, signal processing, neuroscience, nonlinear dynamics, quantum mechanics, and many other areas. Kevin is the editor of the peer review open access journal Entropy, as well as being a member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies and co-investigator on a NASA-funded grant to study exoplanets. Back in September of 2009, he published the landmark paper estimating the flight characteristics of anomalous, unidentified aerial vehicles co-authored by Robert M. Powell and Peter Reale. In that paper, he described UAPs as reportedly being structured craft that exhibit impossible flight characteristics. So, Kevin, welcome back, sir. It is truly a pleasure and an absolute honor to have you with me today. Well, thank you so much for having me. So I want to start out with the recent Aero Historical Report, which claimed to find no evidence of extraterrestrials, and it seems fitting by touching on some comments that you have made about skepticism. In your recent presentation at the Seoul Conference, you said, I am skeptical. I'm skeptical of people who assume they've witnessed an alien spacecraft. I'm also skeptical of scientists who assume that anomalous observations are an error because they know their physics and there can be nothing anomalous and anything strange out there. So on that note, where do you think that this all falls down, I guess? Right. Well, it's um, it's complicated. The certainly the the Arrow report was meant to be a historical summary of UAPs UAPs um, and for for Congress. I mean, Congress requested that, um, and I'm I'm not surprised they didn't find evidence of extraterrestrials. I mean, how how do you go about proving that something's extraterrestrial? Um, I've joked that one of the only ways to do it to convince people you'd have to kick, grab you'd have to pull an alien kicking and screaming out of its craft on national television um, after it landed in Central Park or something. I mean that's the, that that would convince a lot of people. But um, proving that something is extraterrestrial is difficult, and in fact, the terminology has changed. You know, in the U.S. government, um, especially where Congress is concerned. Um, they haven't been using the term extraterrestrial. They've been using the term non-human. Mm, and um, okay. and I think that's more reasonable. Um, so now, now, of course, we note that Arrow doesn't mention anything about non-humans. It mentions extraterrestrials, which is a very different um, thing. So um, and, the, and one of the hypotheses now is that these non-humans live here on Earth. Um, and very possibly in our oceans, and this is this is a, a major. Um, this the, 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 this is um, the important point to realize when you you know look at the error report and see you know there's no evidence of extraterrestrials. Well, of course there's not. Um, now, um, as an historical report, the error report is extremely disappointing. Um, it's full of factual errors. There's many things that haven't been covered that um, that are important to the UAP problem. So, so for for example, I mean, just just a few off the top of my head. Um, they got the he got they got the um, date of the Kenneth Arnold um, observations of the UFOs in 1947 wrong. They're off by a day. The um, shape of the craft is wrong in the error report they described in the saucer shape. Kenneth Arnold said they were crescent shaped. Um, this is different. Um, so they didn't even they couldn't even report what Kenneth Arnold saw in 1947 correctly. This is on Wikipedia. I mean, you could have they could have gotten this information from Wikipedia correctly. So it's it's a little surprising how little effort and little care went into this report. Um, so, so it just it just leaves you wanting. I, I really, you know, I'm I'm skeptical that they tried. It doesn't seem like they this was kind of a half-assed effort. Um, something that they were bothered with. Oh, Congress wants us to do this. Well, let's just throw this together and get it out the door. Um, that's what it seems like. There's no mention of 
incursions at UFO incursions at nuclear weapon sites. Um, there's a whole uh, piece written by the people at SCU on the history of um, incursions at um, nuclear weapons and nuclear production sites in the um, in the 1940s, and that that itself is a paper that's a lot longer than the Arrow Report. So um, there's no mention of that happening. Um, I, I even have a newspaper article from actually it's a newspaper ad put out by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1951, and they are asking for help. They're asking for people to report UFOs around atomic energy plants. Hmm. I've got a newspaper article that says this. It's put out by the, you know, by the Atomic Energy Commission. So why isn't this in the report? I mean, this is clearly of uh, national security interest. So there's, there's a lot missing. And... Um, and yeah, there's a part two coming, but I don't have a lot of hope for, you know, the sequel's never better than the original. So get it right the first time. It's the way I try to do things. So, and that's what I would expect. I would expect more from a, from a, another PhD. Yeah. Well, and the reason that I wanted to start with your Soul Foundation presentation was you were talking about that skeptical mindset where people have kind of closed their mind to the opportunities or the possibilities, right? And I think that is kind of the critical piece here. Um, now, former Aero Director Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick was recently quoted on the extraterrestrial hypothesis by The Guardian as saying there is absolute true belief which would suggest that it is more akin to a religion than an actual factual thing and those are the people that you're never going to convince no matter what you put in front of them so in your opinion do his statements reflect that intractical skepticism i guess that we are concerned about or do you think that he might be just speaking from a perspective of disappointment at not finding you know the quote unquote smoking gun evidence of crash retrievals that we would all hope would have come out. Yeah, the the report, it sounds more like he has a chip on his shoulder than disappointment. Um, and we'll see what the second report talks about. But, you know, I published a peer-reviewed scientific paper that estimates the speeds and accelerations of these things. And these objects are clearly moving at speeds comparable to spacecraft. I think that's all you need to say. Um, the You can go a bit further. The accelerations are such that if you were to accelerate at the rates that we've observed, um, these things would be approaching relativistic speeds, 90% the speed of light in a matter of hours, less than a day. Um, so are these interstellar craft? They appear that their flight capabilities appear to be consistent with that. Now, I'm not alone in this. Um, Herman Oberth, the founder of modern rocketry, he was he was mentor to Werner von Braun, gave a talk on UFOs in 1954. What is that? Um, 70 years ago now, right? 1954. 70 years ago, he gave a talk on UFOs, and he noted in his talk that these things have been observed by radar traveling at speeds up to 19 kilometers a second, which is on the order of 40,000 miles an hour. The space station only goes 17,000 miles an hour. So this is moving. These are things were observed in 1954 and noted by a rocketry expert um, moving at speeds twice as fast as the space shuttle did. Why do people think they're spacecraft? Because they move as fast as spacecraft do. Um, I think that's reasonable. And for that not to be noted, why is why is Herman Oberth's talk not mentioned in um, the Arrow Report? He was mentor to Werner von Braun. Is that person not of import? I mean, he, and 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 moreover, he goes on in the talk to note that. Had it only been two or three observations, he would have discarded them as being an error. But he had seen more than 50 observations, 50 radar observations of, of these objects moving at these high speeds. So this clearly was well known to some cadre of people in 1954, 70 years ago. 
and you and, and I'm now expected to believe that the Pentagon is completely ignorant of this. Um, if, if that's the case, then I should be worried. I mean, why somebody's not doing their job? A, a lot of this to me kind of goes to acceptable levels of evidence, right? And I think one of the challenges is, you know, you can really argue any piece or any set of evidence, right? I mean, you start with a hypothesis that can be disproved, and then you move on to a theory which can still be disproved or overthrown, right? So, you know, as much as we like to have certainty in life, there there's always levels of certainty. It's never a complete absolute. And so I wanted to ask, scientifically speaking, if we have enough data to establish that UFOs are a real phenomenon, as the ODNI has said, and can we go further and say that they are intelligently controlled vehicles and potentially even extraterrestrial in origin? I think that you can easily say that they're real phenomena. Um, I think that's now pretty well established. Um, are they intelligently controlled? Um, clearly they are. They don't move around randomly. Um, they, When there are multiple UFOs together, they often fly in formation. Um, so they appear to be intelligently controlled. And I think you can say that much. Um, their flight characteristics, the amounts of energy that's involved, their luminosities, their magnetic fields and electric fields that have been detected and measured are all way off the charts, way too high for anything that's that would be considered human technology. So I think that you are left with very few hypotheses at this point. This these do appear to be non-human, some type of non-human technology. Well, and and for helps. and for for somebody like Kirkpatrick to just dismiss that out of hand, I think is really ridiculous at this point. And but but this is how the Pentagon's been operating for eighty years. Um, I would like to see, you know, I'd like to see more evidence that they have that these things aren't unusual. And I would like them to pick cases where we already have determined them to be unusual. And, it, and... it helps to baseline this. I, that's what I think. It, it helped at this point. There has been so much change in the narrative, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, again, one of the things that I'm seeing, and I'm going off my questions list here, but um, when I got into this in 2017, and I'd had, you know, a couple of decades of exposure to this before then, but it, it was the Nimitz story and the Nimitz narrative. And then I found what you guys were doing at the SCU, which is absolutely brilliant rigorous, detailed scientific work, you know, and so I started to see the science moving forward and a very structured linear narrative emerging. And I think all of that got turned on its ear last year. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing in terms of society, but in terms of the science, I think it has created a lot of confusion. And I think it, my impression was some of that came through in the Arrow Report as well. I got the impression that, I mean, number one, I think that they're operating under somewhat of a siege mentality just from the get-go, right? They're not going to make everybody happy no matter what they do, no matter what they say. The military is like, we don't want to deal with it. You know, the general public is like, we want answers and full disclosure. The UFO community is like, you know, show us the bodies. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like they have an impossible job, and, and that might result in some of the uh, – you know, in some of the, what came through in the report. Now, let me jump back to that for a moment, though. Sean Kirkpatrick told Scientific American last month, this is really just a microcosm of a really large problem of distrust in government, distrust of how we conduct operations, investigations, how we govern, and our capacity to do so. And for me, that statement was probably just as big, if not bigger, than the Arrow Report itself. As I've said before, 38% of Americans believe in UFOs. 65% believe the government is hiding information of some kind about this issue. And public trust in government is near record lows at only 16%. So one thing I'm really wondering is, do you think that 75 years of government secrecy and mistrust past efforts like Blue Book and the Condon Report hamper or even make it impossible for Arrow to really do its job effectively? 
I don't really know. I don't know how Arrow operates. I don't know what their command structure is. I don't know, you know, what they were um, told to do, um, especially with regards to this report. And um, this was supposed to be a historical report. It is severely lacking in that. And so it doesn't lead to that. That alone doesn't lead to a lot of trust. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether to trust their, to, to distrust their intentions or to distrust their capabilities. I don't know which it is, and it looks like it's probably both, actually. Um, so that, that's a big problem. Um, there, there's more reasons to distrust this because we have heard, you know, claims that, you know, Kirkpatrick was lying at multiple points. And, and, and I know of one case where I know that he was not being truthful. Um, our UAPX team briefed Arrow in February of 2023, last year. And Arrow has a copy or had had a copy of my peer-reviewed scientific paper on the speeds and accelerations. And then later in March of that year, March last year, um, he was asked by Senator Gillibrand whether there have ever been any scientific publications suggesting that these things might be um, and I don't know whether she used the term extraterrestrial or non-human, but, you know, but that basically some unusual, I'll use the word unusual, I'm just paraphrasing here. And he said, no, there have not been any peer-reviewed scientific papers suggesting this, which is completely wrong. Now, the, the Israelis have a copy of my paper. There's the paper, there's the report written for the Bagan Sadat Institute um, called the Pentagon on the Pentagon UAP Task Force, written by Frank Milburn. And in that document, um, about three pages of that document are dedicated to the results that I um, published in my scientific paper. So the Israelis knew this, um, but the Pentagon doesn't, um, or didn't re did Kirkpatrick not remember? Was he not being truthful? I don't know which. Is he incapable or lying? I, don't, I can't say, but... Um, but it certainly leads to distrust. So if he's worried yeah. about people distrusting the government, well, the buck stops here. I mean, if you're working for the government, be truthful and do your best. Um, that's where it starts with the government employees. Well, you know, another thing that was talked about in the report and that the report just echoed something that has been in the community in general is this uh, confusion of black projects for NHI craft, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, in your own work, the documented speeds and acceleration for UAP would liquefy a human pilot and crush a traditional airframe. And as Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and Avi Loeb pointed out, air ablation at those speeds would be unsurvivable. So could UAP performance, along with what may be evidence of gravitational lensing in the 2013 Aguadilla video, be hints that UAP could be using some kind of warp drive for gravitational modification technology? They're clearly doing something else. I mean, they're clearly not behaving according to the Newtonian laws of physics that we're used to. Um, they're clearly doing something different. Um, and yeah, this is, and, and, and not, not only, this isn't new again, Herman Oberth talked about this in 1954. So this isn't what black projects were running in 1954 that could be mistaken for, that could have been traveling at 42,000 miles an hour. Um, why isn't that being addressed? And, you know, these objects have been seen for, for, you know, decades. Um, I have reports of, of, UFOs coming out of the water, hovering next to ships, and then taking off into clouds, going back into the 1800s. Were they Russian and Chinese then? Is that a American black ops project from 1875? Are you kidding me? Um, let's be. If you're gonna if you're gonna cover the history, cover the history. And there's a long history of these things, and ships records report these things related to the ocean again, which keeps coming up. I'm to, to Admiral. Colladet recently published his Soul White Paper on this. You know, these things are clearly related to the oceans. And they've been reported by ships for more than 100 years. Um, but let's talk about history if we're going to talk about history. And 
but see a real historical report. Well, this goes to, again, what you've written about in terms of uh, you worked on the Drake equation, you've looked at astrobiology, and you've tried to do some estimates on alien civilizations expanding throughout the galaxy. And for me, that was incredibly interesting because I, I have this real interest in the SETI aspect of it and just our place in the universe, I guess. And so one of the things that came out of your papers was this idea that if if UAP are extraterrestrial in origin, they may have actually arrived here hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? And that, to me, brings up some larger questions about like as you've suggested early human myths or ships logs reports things along those lines may actually be sighting reports by people who just didn't understand what they were looking at and it also opens up this question of whether we should really be calling them extraterrestrial i mean you know I, i'm wondering they live if here. they're not humans yeah. let's just stick with yeah. that yeah yeah and so yeah. NHI, and, NHI know, might be a better word. Maybe most of these craft are automated. We don't really know. There's a lot we don't know. And you can't get down to addressing what you don't know when you're constantly arguing about whether they're real or not with people who just don't want to look at the evidence and don't report the evidence. And that's, and that's difficult. Well, in terms of interstellar travel, in the Soul Foundation presentation, you did make a really good case for interstellar travel by UAP without exceeding the speed of light also. And I think for me, that helps push back against some of the concerns from the physics community, you know, who have said, well, it's impossible to go faster than the speed of light. And so therefore, you know, X, Y, and Z can't have happened. Um, you know, but what you have said is even within known physics, the kind of performance that we are seeing in these craft could allow them to travel at substantial portions of light speed, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, the trick the trick is to look at the evidence you have and then infer what's going on from that. Um now of course you can deny the evidence that you have, which is what, you know, is a lot of scientists try to do or ignore the evidence that exists, but um, but I'll go back to Herman Oberth in 1954, and I joked about that in the Soul Foundation talk where there's a picture of him, and he looks very grumpy. He's grumpy because people still aren't listening. Um, there were, He had personally seen at least 50 radar observations of UFOs traveling at speeds up to around 40,000 miles an hour. That's what he states. Um, the speed of a thousand miles an hour in 1954 would have been a big deal. That would have been beyond the the airspeed record then. This is 40 times that. I mean, how how wrong do you have to be um, until people start paying attention? Um, and we've known about this for somebody has known about this for 70 years. Um, why don't the right people know? Why aren't the right people admitting that they know? I, I can't answer that, unfortunately. But One the, of the, the good news is that some of us scientists are now catching on, and we're now paying attention, and we're going to work to figure this out. <clears throat> well, that so that takes me to another aspect of this, and I'm jumping around in my questions, and so that's why I, it probably seems a little disconnected. But That's, that's all right. I'm sorry. My answer is all over the board, so... <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, you know what? It's mostly, it's mostly me. I've got, I have a wonderful questions list. I keep going up and down, up and down. Um, the, the federal government lags far behind the private sector in most emerging science and technology, right? And that is a trend where we've, I, I think that we've seen reversal over the last 50 years or so. You know, in your World War II era, the post-World War II, the government was ahead right in the nuclear era they were on the cutting edge of things we've seen a complete about face where areas like ai biotech electric vehicles these areas the private sector is way out in front and one of the things that strikes me is that the ufo community seems stuck on this need for approval and disclosure that the dod just doesn't want to provide so i've been wondering i mean Again, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence has unequivocally stated that UFOs are real. I'm wondering if that's enough. Is it time to leave the government behind? And are organizations like the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies and the Soul Foundation starting to do that? 
Yeah, I think that's exactly what needs to happen. Um, and the, the, I mean, the reason why the private sector is so far ahead is because scientists and engineers in academia and the private sector work together. You've got thousands of minds on the problem. Whereas in a black project, you've got five minds on the problem and they can't only talk to each other and they can't talk to anyone else. I mean, you, you, you don't get anywhere that way. Um, you can keep things secret and you can keep it under control and that's all great, but you aren't going to make the fantastic progress you make when you put a thousand minds together, sharing information, sharing ideas, sharing data. Um, that's, that's really important. And, um, and that's why we've seen this this turnaround. And in fact, I've had friends who do black work who have commented that, you know, I, I remember one 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 friend in particular. I was up, up late having a long talks with him about all sorts of things, and I asked him, "Is the black work you guys do? Are you really that far ahead of the rest of us?" And he said, "In a few things, but mostly not, because um, the people who do." Um, work that requires clearance only read papers that are are classified because their opinion and their mindset is that if it's not classified, it's not important. And so they miss all the stuff that's happening around, you know, the rest of the world. Um, I think that's a big problem. And so I think this is how, you know, we're going to have to solve the UAP problem. We keep yeah, the UFO community keeps running back to the U.S. government. Oh, please tell us, please tell us, please tell us. And and I don't know, I mean, I don't know what to do with that because I don't think I'd believe them if they told us. I mean, whatever they tell us, I'm not going to believe. I want to see evidence. And they, you know, so just telling us isn't enough. And and they clearly aren't going to provide evidence. They've had opportunities to do so for 80 years now, um, presumably. And... um Look, there's other games in town. The USA, the U.S. is not the only country on the planet, and they're not the only country in the planet that's dealt with UFOs. So dealing with um, the U.S. government, forget it. Go to another country. Try to get information from them. Um, hundreds of countries on this planet, and um, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And now we've got a bigger opportunity is now – Scientists are, some scientists are catching on that this is a real thing and there are opportunities for learning something here. And um, there are scientists now picking up the problem and saying, well, what can I do with this? You know, what, what how could I tr help in studying this? I get emails like this every week, you know, from scientists thanking me for the work I'm doing and asking how they can help. Um, so, so things are changing dramatically. Um, scientists are always hungry for new discoveries, and once they discover, once they realize that there's discoveries here, um, you know, there's I, somebody was telling me, oh, I want to study UAPs and get a Nobel Prize. I'm like, there's not just one Nobel Prize here that one person could get. There's many discoveries here. Um, this is rich in unknowns and uh, and, ex and exciting. It's an exciting area to work in. Well, and to me, this goes to a lot of cultural challenges, right? And I think because this evolved over such a long period of time, you know, we've got all of this cultural baggage that's associated with it. One of the things that you have done that I'm really excited about is this attempt to connect the UAP phenomenon to a larger scientific framework of astrobiology. Now, from what I've seen, the astronomers who are doing SETI, the astronomers hunting for exoplanets, and UAP researchers tend to be separated into two or three different cultural groups, right? And it becomes this issue of, you know, never the twain shall meet. You know, the folks doing this don't believe in the folks doing that, you know? And, and so they're not collaborating. And one of the things that I've wondered if it's time to bridge that gap and start looking at all of these areas as part of a larger discipline. Well, I think, and I think things are changing there too. Um, traditionally, um, the, you know, the SETI folks have really put off UFOs, have a very hard time with them and still do. And that's historical. Um, the SETI wasn't treated seriously by the scientific community for decades. And so they, they have pretty much, you know, to some degree, they've overcome that. And um, and good for them. I mean, it's a I, I think SETI is entirely worthwhile. 
and I'm very supportive of it. But um, and so they've overcome those difficulties. But I think there's a fear that taking on UFOs under the umbrella of SETI would would make them, um, you know, would somehow put them out of favor with the rest of the scientific community again. And they may, they may very well be right about that. So um, so that's a difficult thing. And I and they've kind of taken a middle of the road um, approach to looking for techno signatures. Now, most of the work is done looking for techno signatures in other star systems, you know, which is what SETI, SETI excels at. And, um, you know, but, but an extension to that is, you know, our, there have been efforts to look for techno signatures on the moon, techno signatures on Mars, techno signatures in asteroids or in orbit around the sun um, with the, the middle of the road idea that, well, aliens might have come here and set up some satellites to observe or observe Earth, right? Well, well, you know, but anybody who's done any satellite work, like me, knows that one of the most important aspects of satellite research is ground truth. You have to get ground truth to know what you're looking at. So if you're going to come and observe Earth from the moon, well, that's not going to be helpful unless you go to the ground, unless you go to Earth. So... Anybody traveling this distance to come here to observe Earth isn't going to waste any time in orbit. They're going to drop down to the surface. Uh, so I think that that mindset's a little silly, but um, but it's a mindset that's coming from the, well, if we've got alien machinery operating on Earth, that's going to look like UFOs. So it looks like we support UFOs and we can't do that. So I think there's a lot of worry about that. Yeah, And I've heard SETI people complain also that, well, you know, UFOs get all the attention and we barely get any funding. Well, yeah, because if they're here, we there's a, it's it's a bigger problem than if we find them at Proxima Centauri. So that that's that's why. Um, well, I also wanted to ask about um, going back to the UAP narrative. So before David Grush, this narrative was focused again on the Navy sightings, it didn't involve ET biologics or crash retrievals. And whatever his actual testimony was, because I think that we know the general gist of it, but you know, most of it is still locked up and classified, right? So it's hanging there in a limbo. And I don't think any of us have any idea. I mean, I hope to God this doesn't end up like the Kennedy files where they keep reclassifying it, you know, for the next hundred years or so. Um, yeah, put, it off, put it off for 50 years until everybody involved is dead. I mean, that's basically what they're doing, which makes you worry about guilt again and makes you worry about whether you can trust them. Um, so if you want to have a government you can trust, just be open. Tell us what's going on. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see the David Grush files. Let's see what evidence he had. Um, show us. Give us. I'm a skeptical. Give me the evidence. Um, I'm a scientist. I want to see evidence. I want well, to see evidence again, that something that somebody sees is an alien craft. I want to see the evidence of that. And I want to see the evidence that Grush saw something. And Grush doesn't need to provide that. He can't provide that. Somebody else in the government has to give that authorization. So do it. So going back to this skepticism, though, um, do you think that the UFO community, and again, to, to do this in the most credible way possible, right, to get that SETI level of credibility over time, I mean, is it good to probably basically put his testimony and the ET biologics and the crash retrieval and all of that stuff kind of on hold and kind of refocus on that original narrative, right, the stuff that we know rather than things that we think we know, and then just wait for validation of those larger claims over time. I, th I think that that's best. I, I, as much as I was interested in learning about what Grush learned, and I would like to see what he knew, I'd like to see the evidence for it. Um, even the evidence he saw, even if he didn't see bodies and craft, but he heard about programs, I'd like to learn about that. That would be interesting. So I'd want to see the evidence. But on some level, as you pointed out, I think that his coming out was more harmful than good in the sense that it distracted everybody with stories again. I mean, we're back to stories without evidence, which is which is not how we any of us should be operating. Um and so, 
and this is one reason why, you know, the work I do and the, um, and what I presented at the Soul Foundation, I focused on the physics. What, what aspects of these objects do we have evidence for? Um, instead of trying to decide whether they're alien or not, just characterize them. What are they like? What do they do? How fast do they go? Do they have electric and magnetic fields? Do they have gravitational fields? I mean, do they do they smell like watermelon? Whatever characteristic there is, um, just let's characterize them and find out what we're dealing with first. And then after we've characterized these things, we can then maybe start to classify them. Um, maybe some, and some of these could be black projects. Some of these might be autonomous alien probes. Some might be natural atmospheric phenomena. And that's all very possible. They're not just one thing. And, um, but we can't begin to classify them until we characterize them. And that's the way I look at it. But that's a very scientific mindset rather than a, I want to know whether they're alien mindset, right? Which is a very different mindset. Absolutely. But that's not, but the, I want to know if they're alien is not a productive mindset. It doesn't get you anywhere. Well, and I, and I want to go somewhere. So <clears throat> on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. Again, it has truly been a pleasure and an absolute honor. So in the show notes, I'm going to put links to the soul foundation presentation. You went through a series of graphs. I mean, very detailed analysis of UAP performance, flight characteristics, the history, all of that. And that is material that people need to, they need to know. They need to know what's already been collected, what's out there, and what the hard data is. And so I'm going to put the, the Soul Foundation presentation in the show notes. Oh, and thank you. Let, absolutely. It, let me close by asking, what is coming up next for you? I think that you have a presentation coming up, right? And, and what else do you expect? Yeah, I have a presentation of an astronomy. There's an astronomy conference coming up in the UK. And the focus of that conference is about um, about um, extraterrestrial life in the universe, basically, and um, and how do we encounter it, and how do what's how do we deal with that fact when it happens? I think that's kind of the theme of the conference, and so I'm going to be talking about my um, simulations of 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 galactic colonization, the interstellar colonization problem and the simulations I've been running on that, that basically inform you as to what qualities a civilization needs to be able to pull something like that off. And, um, and, and using our knowledge of physics to, um, using what we believe we know about physics to um, come to that conclusion so that we can better assess what we believe is possible. Um, very often scientists will say, well, I don't think that's possible because then they just throw one random reason out there. Um, whereas, you know, whereas I don't think you could have anybody come here from another star system because you can't go faster than light. Well, um, really that's not the only piece of information you need to assess the problem. And so, um, so I, I'm trying to do that through simulations, which I think is a reasonable way to basically educate your prior knowledge about the problem. And, um, and I think that's helpful. And, and, and it's, and it's a way of bridging this gap. Um, you don't have, you know, what, where the hypoth the extraterrestrial or non-human hypothesis for UFOs requires such a huge worldview change in your mind that you need to, um, that people really need a bridge. They need a bridge to be able to make those changes. And so um, I'm working on handling that in, with a series of papers. So one is this research paper on the interstellar colonization to show that it's possible um, and possible without going faster than the speed of light. And another paper I'm working on is called Why Visit Earth? Because that's another thing you hear scientists say all the time. Why would anyone bother to come here? Well, you know, we spend how many billions of dollars exploring Mars? What's on Mars? I mean, Mars is not that interesting compared to Earth. Earth is fascinating. Um, go to, you know, take a trip, go somewhere, go walk in the woods, go, go mull about in a field. And I use that phrase because I remember another astronomer once said, um, I don't know why aliens would come here and then 
just mull about in a field. Well, that's what I would do on an alien planet. <laughs> I would seeing a field on an alien planet would be fascinating and exciting. Um, so, but we don't have that mindset. We have this idea that Earth is boring somehow. Earth is the coolest planet in the solar system, and um, and then we have this other strange thought that. This is something else that's commonly believed is that why would an advanced technology, you know, an advanced civilization want to visit a primitive one? Well, first, technology isn't linear. Um, people can develop different technologies in different ways at different rates. Um, we still are learning about medicines from people in South America, from indigenous peoples in South America. We learn about medicines from them. Um, there are things to learn. They have technologies we don't have. Um, and somebody coming here would maybe find that we have technologies they don't have. Um, we have taken the wheel and run with it. I mean, that invention, the wheel. I mean, look what we do with the wheel. I mean, that's an amazing thing, right? That's now, a civilization that invented the wheel and shortly thereafter de invented a levitation probably never developed the wheel to its fullest extent, right? So there could be something in that they find interesting there. That's just a silly example, but to, to make the point. So there's a lot of reasons to come to Earth. Um, there's better ones, and I'm going to save that for the paper, um, which, which I'm putting together. But, but these papers are meant to bridge, try to bridge this worldview change that um, this strange idea that, you know, people can't travel between, beings can't travel between stars, they're too far, and beings can't, wouldn't bother coming here. These two weird ideas that I really don't see at all. Wow. I think Earth is a cool place, and if anybody ever detected Earth, I think they if we detected Earth, we'd have an effort to get there uh, within a century. Um, that would be our goal. If we ever found an Earth-like planet with life on it, uh, we would be trying to get there. So I can only assume that somebody else would do the same with this planet. Absolutely. Well, Kevin, let me thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.